the world's biggest social media sites, and the app that proves Americans can read subtitles just fine when they want to. Yeah. <laughs> Hundreds of millions of people around the world use TikTok every day. Because, I mean, what else are you gonna do while you're pooping, right? But <laughs> what many TikTok users might not realize is TikTok is owned by a Chinese company. And now we're finding out that while you're watching videos of people dancing, China might be watching you. Leaked audio from social media company TikTok's internal meeting suggests that Beijing has repeatedly accessed data from users here in the U.S. The recording suggests that TikTok is falling down on its promise to wall off Americans' data from its Chinese parent company, with one of the app's researchers telling colleagues, quote, I get my instructions from the main office in Beijing. Oh, no! China's secretly watching all of us on TikTok. Now they're gonna know our money doesn't jiggle jiggle, it folds. <laughs> but yeah, based on these audio leaks, it looks like TikTok's parent company in China actually does have access to our private data, which means the Chinese government probably has access to our private data, which is scary because TikTok knows everything about you. Yeah, it tracks what you watch, what you like, and then it only shows you that stuff. Like, if you asked me to see my For You page, I'd be like, whoa, 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 that's too personal. Yeah, just look at my nudes instead. <laughs> Actually, that's a mini Coke. And that's why, if you remember, Donald Trump was trying to ban TikTok a couple of years ago, right? Because the US government realized that China could use this as a tool to influence Americans. And also because Eric kept trying to send him friend requests. And you know, <laughs> it's a little crazy how we're so hooked on social media that governments don't even need to steal our data anymore, right? We'll just give it to them. Like back in the day, they'd have to hack into a database or break into the social security building. Now we're just giving it to them for free. And I blame myself. Yeah, I'm part of this problem. I also took part in that personal information challenge. <laughs> Big mistake. I hope I go viral. <laughs> all right, let's move on from all the data that you're putting into TikTok to all the data that's coming out of the January 6 hearings. The investigation that will somehow result in less punishment than the Oscars slap. Last week, we learned mostly about how Trump knew that he had lost. Then we learned about how Mike Pence almost got hanged. And today's session was all about how President Trump and his allies tried to pressure state officials to sign on to his various schemes for overturning the election. Everything from throwing out Biden votes, to creating slates of fake electors, to even eating the Constitution really fast before anyone could look up the election laws. <laughs> and one of the people Trump depended on most in this pressure campaign was Rudy Giuliani, his personal lawyer <laughs> and final boss in a Resident Evil game. <laughs> Unfortunately, it seemed like no one wanted to take Rudy's calls. Pennsylvania House Speaker Brian Cutler received daily voicemails from Trump's lawyers in the last week of November. Mr. Speaker, this is Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis. We're calling you together because we'd like to discuss, obviously, the election. Hey, Brian, it's Rudy. I really have something important to call to your attention that I think really changes things. Cutler felt that the outreach was inappropriate and asked his lawyers to tell Rudy Giuliani to stop calling, but Giuliani continued to reach out. I understand that you don't want to talk to me now. I just want to bring some facts to your attention and talk to you as a fellow Republican. Oh, wow, that's desperate. Yeah, Rudy made so many unanswered calls, the iPhone just started labeling him as spam. Yeah. <laughs> and not just his calls, his body, it's 90% spam. <laughs> and can we acknowledge what a fall this has been? Huh? This man went from being an American hero to now sounding like a telemarketer selling a coup. If you order now, I'll throw in that chair Abraham Lincoln is sitting on. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? 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 <laughs> and you know, this is just another example of how historic President Trump really was. Any other time in US history, if the president's lawyer called someone, they would take that call. But when Trump's vampire lawyer called people, <laughs> everyone was like, tell him I'm not here. <laughs> Yeah, tell him I went camping and I died. A bear, a bear ate my face. Tell him I'm not here. <laughs> also, not that I'm encouraging it, because I'm not. But if you are, 
going to try and overturn an election? Maybe don't leave voicemails? <laughs> it's a paper trail. Also, it's 2022. Text. Who leaves voicemails? You realize how thirsty you're coming off? Hey, it's me again. <laughs> Come on, Rudy. Just hit him with a quick late night, you up for subverting democracy? Eggplant emoji, red hat emoji, vampire emoji. Come on, Rudy. Keep up with the times. All right, but let's move on. It has now been almost a month since the tragic school shooting in Uvalde. And while shootings like this are always traumatic, this particular one has been made worse by how the police in Uvalde have responded, right? They didn't go in. They waited for an hour, and then they even stopped parents from trying to save their own kids. And if that wasn't bad enough, they've been trying to block information about that day from coming out. And each time more information comes out, we learn why. This morning, the first surveillance image from inside Robb Elementary emerges. The photo showing multiple police officers standing inside the building with rifles and at least one ballistic shield 19 minutes after the gunman entered. This, despite school police chief Pete Aradondo's original claim that the officers weren't properly armed to take down the gunman at that point. Officers didn't enter the classroom and kill the shooter until 58 minutes later. The state's director of public safety Safety Stephen McCraw testifying before lawmakers, blasting law enforcement's response as his department's investigation uncovers new evidence about the massacre. He says officers were waiting for keys to enter, but investigators finding the door couldn't be locked from the inside and saying that officers never even tried opening it. Yeah, you know, the story just keeps getting worse and worse. Every single time we learn something, it gets worse and worse. We already knew that they waited far too long to confront the shooter. But now we found out that they lied about not having enough weapons to go in. Because it turns out they had assault rifles, they had body armor, and ballistic shields. So I'm sorry, what else were they waiting for? The invincible star from Mario? What was that, huh? Get the f in the room. Like, how did they not go in? You know, which is, by the way, another thing that we've learned. They didn't even try to get in the classroom. They didn't even try. They told everyone that they had to wait for a key because the door was locked, but the door wasn't locked. They just never tried to open it, which, which is ridiculous. Even people waiting outside like a locked bathroom at Starbucks will jiggle the handle <laughs> after two minutes just to be sure, sure, they'll try. But it turns out these cops couldn't do what? Like what, what the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park took five minutes to learn? They couldn't do that? <laughs> just that? And you know what's insane about this whole story is how the one time, the one time it would have been appropriate to go in guns blazing, the cops decide to have a picnic outside, yeah. But if you're black or you have a broken taillight, oh, then all of a sudden they go all Rambo on your ass. Ah, oh, we're coming in, we're coming in. It's another reminder that you, you can't just trust what the police say. Like this is one of the clearest reminders. Yes, they're police, yes, you respect them, but it doesn't mean you just trust every single thing that they say after an incident. Journalists shouldn't be reporting what the police said. They should be investigating what actually happened. Because time and time again, time and time again, we learned that cops in America, they basically use the same principle as toddlers. They'll tell the truth, but only if it doesn't get them in trouble. No, mommy, the cookies try to eat me. I was just responding. <laughs> and no, my body camera wasn't working. Yeah, I turned it off. <laughs> All right, finally, let's move on to some lighter news. A lot of exciting stuff happened this weekend. Drake dropped a surprise new album. Beyonce <laughs> dropped a new single. And not to be outdone, President Biden had a drop of his own. A scare for President Biden today when he fell off his bicycle in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. The 79-year-old was stopping to talk to reporters when you see there his foot got caught in the pedal guard as he was dismounting his bike. He quickly got to his feet. Later on his way out of church, the president repeated that he was doing just fine and hopped in place several times to prove it. Oh, President Biden, that, that's just embarrassing. He was just standing and the bike fell over. And you know, it, it's actually too bad because before he fell over, he was looking kind of good, yeah. All of us were like, wow, look at him riding that bike and he's 80 years old. And then he stops and falls and we're like, oh yeah. He's 80 years old, he's 80 years old. 
And you know, it's not just the falling off of the bike that isn't moving, but it's the fact that he thought that hopping <laughs> was gonna reassure Americans that he still got it. You know, that little... No, because you can see, you can see when he was hopping, in his mind, he looked like Creed. He was like, yeah, look at me go, look at me go. When in fact his hopping looked like, you know when someone is trying to escape a kidnapper who tied their legs together? It was like that. <laughs> Now, apparently the reason he fell is because his foot got caught in the pedal cage. And knowing America, it means that right now that bicycle is already at Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> Who do you work for? The Taliban, China, Russia, Kamala? <laughs> ah, the silent treatment, huh? Okay, that's how you wanna play it? Well, you better start talking soon, or by the time I'm done with you, you'll be a one speed. <laughs> Don't get smart with me, you asshole! <laughs> Still though, falling down is always an embarrassing thing to happen to anyone, never mind a president. Which is why former president, Donald Jolly Trump, <laughs> he made sure to weigh in. One of the greatest travesties of all is to see a person in the White House who, even after years of political experience, has absolutely no clue how to be the President of the United States. And I hope he has recovered, because as you know, he fell off his bicycle today. No, I'm serious, I hope he's okay. <laughs> fell off a bicycle. I make this pledge to you today, I will never, ever ride a bicycle. Every bicycle in the world <laughs> breathed a collective sigh of relief. <laughs> He's not gonna ride us, guys. He's not gonna ride us. Thank God. Gasoline, or as scientists call it, dinosaur pee-pee. <laughs> Over the past few months, global demand for oil has kept rising faster than the supply, to the point where the price of gas in the United States is now six billion dollars a gallon. <laughs> so drivers are hurting. The good news is that, as always, President Biden wants to help. The bad news is that, as always, it doesn't look like he can. The president this afternoon called on Congress to temporarily suspend the federal gas tax which is right now about 18 cents a gallon. It's a move President Biden has resisted until today, given that it is unlikely to pass Congress. While officials say a gas tax holiday is worth considering, there is a cost. Those funds are used for repairing roads and infrastructure, important priorities across the country. What the president wants is a three-month gas tax holiday on both regular gas and diesel uh, going into September. He also wants states to pass their similar versions of that gas tax holiday. The president also had a word specifically here for the oil companies. Here's what he said. Bring down the price you are charging at the pump to reflect the cost you are paying for the product. Do it now. Do it today. Why are you talking like that? Is this a secret? Should the rest of us be listening? Why does he do that thing? It's so strange. Like, Joe Biden's the only president whose vibe shifts in the middle of a sentence. Oil companies, you better lower the prices. Please. Please, I'm begging you. If you're president, you just gotta say things. Otherwise, it makes you look weak, you know? You can't be like, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall if you get around to it. It's such an ugly wall, or at least paint it. Come on. And you know, I feel like this is the big difference between Trump and Biden, you know? It's how they use their power. Because with Trump, it was always like, ah, oh, shit, is he gonna use his power? And with Biden, it's like, ah, oh, shit, is he gonna use his power? <laughs> also, whoever decided to call it a gas tax holiday, that person should be fired. It's not a holiday. What does that mean, it's a gas tax holiday? No, just be like, we're not charging gas. It's a gas tax holiday, that's the worst holiday of all time. <laughs> What, you save 18 cents off of gas and I still have to go to work? Are you shitting me? Even Arbor Day is better than that shit. And this is what always confuses me about this country, right? Everywhere in the world, governments manage to protect their populations from corporate greed, right? Like South Africa will limit how high bread prices can go. The EU will be like, you cannot pump chickens with the same hormones they use in the Hulk. In China, they're like, crypto's done and no more dancing on TikTok, only homework. But. 
whenever the American government has to deal with corporations, they've got about as much power as a tortoise that's stuck on its back, you know? It's just like, come on, oil companies. <laughs> come on, pass on your savings. Drug companies, don't overcharge for life-saving drugs, please, <laughs> please. <laughs> but still, this is good news for Americans. Instead of the gas tax going to maintaining roads and infrastructure, drivers will now save 18 cents per gallon. And then you can use those savings to buy a new car after yours gets swallowed up by a pothole. <laughs> but let's move on to a different problem facing practically everyone in America, gun violence. There have been many mass shootings in America over the past couple of decades. And after each one, People have always said, maybe this time will be different. Maybe Congress will do something about this. And every time, Congress was like, no. But ever since the mass shooting in Buffalo and Uvalde last month, a group of senators from both parties have been working together to see if they can find any common ground on gun reform. And it turns out this time is different, ever so slightly. This morning, after decades of partisan gridlock, a major breakthrough in Congress, 14 Republicans joining all 50 Democrats to advance a new compromise on gun restrictions. This is a breakthrough. And more importantly, it's a bipartisan breakthrough. The deal includes enhanced background checks for people between 18 and 21, closing the so-called boyfriend loophole, preventing romantic partners convicted of domestic violence from buying guns directing more money for states to implement their own plans to address gun violence, and billions for school security upgrades and mental health services. And Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell calls the deal a common sense package of popular steps that will help make these horrifying incidents less likely while fully upholding the Second Amendment. Oh, I agree with Senator Mitch McConnell. Thank God the precious Second Amendment has been preserved. Oh, yes. I mean, I'm all for protecting kids, but the Second Amendment, oh. Have you seen that little face? Have you seen it? Whose Second Amendment are you? Whose Second Amendment are you? Oh, you're so, so adorable. Sometimes I feel like Americans want to protect the Constitution more than they want to protect the Americans the Constitution is supposed to protect. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, I'm glad we could protect the Second Amendment. I'll tell you now, if the Second Amendment was in that classroom in Uvalde, the cops would have bust the door down with Mitch McConnell right behind them. You rip your car, yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> and I will say, look, I know for a lot of people, it can be hard to know how to feel about this deal because it doesn't include a lot of things that people want. You know, it doesn't ban assault rifles. It doesn't raise age limits. It doesn't even do universal background checks, which is the most basic thing imaginable. So for some, this kind of thing, you know, feels like trying to stop Godzilla by dropping a few mouse traps around the city. <laughs> but on the other hand, on the other hand, after three decades of nothing happening, this deal is something. Please remember that, it is something. It's not gonna solve everything, but it's something. And something is always better than nothing. That's the entire philosophy behind the hand job. <laughs> All right, let's move on. If you've been out in New York City over the past few years, especially pandemic and through it, you've probably noticed a wild new phenomenon. And no, I'm not talking about how the stuff dripping from air conditioners doesn't taste as good as it used to. <laughs> Which, no, it really bothers me. It used to have like a flavor. It had a tang when it would like fall in your mouth. You'd be like, mmm. No, the problem I'm talking about is the squads of dirt bikes and ATVs flooding the streets and sidewalks like Trump supporters trying to find Mike Pence. <laughs> Well now, the mayor of New York City has decided to crush this problem, literally. Today, heavy machinery crushed illegal ATVs, dirt bikes, and motorcycles confiscated by the NYPD. Mayor Eric Adams waved a checkered flag and work began. He said this effort was to ensure these vehicles cannot ever terrorize the city again. The NYPD says that it has seized more than 2,000 of these vehicles citywide, an increase of more than 80% from this time last year. Hell yeah, baby! Crush those bikes! That's what I want from my city government! Yeah! I don't even care about the underfunded schools anymore, because this shit rocks! By the way, why is he waving a checkered flag at the beginning of a race? <laughs> Does he not understand how a race works? The guy in the truck is like, I've finished already? 
Now look, I will admit, as a New Yorker, humble brag, <laughs> maybe this isn't the biggest problem the city is facing right now. You know, rents are driving people out of their homes. Traffic is always bad. And the subways are always shutting down. Because I, I think we have trains that are scared of the dark or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think that's what it is in New York. You see, because they, they're fine, and then they go into a tunnel, and then they're just like, ah, 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 you guys should walk. I don't know what to do. This is scary. In fact, instead of crushing these bikes, maybe the city could have used them to solve some of the city's problems. You know, I mean, this could have been the solution to the subway problem. Instead of those trains that are always breaking down, just drop a bunch of dirt bikes into the tunnel, you know? <laughs> yeah, let people wheelie to work. Or give them to the police so that they don't have to ride horses anymore. What are you doing, stopping crime in the 1850s? Huh? <laughs> there are cattle rustlers on Broadway. <laughs> or just hire the dirt bike kids to ride around neighborhoods where the rents have gotten unaffordable. Help keep the prices down. <laughs> the studio apartment <laughs> with no bathroom. You want it? You want it? It costs $6,000 a month. What? All right, give me 50 bucks, you can have it. All right, and finally, if you're one of those people who really likes to vape, well, first of all, congratulations on being basic. <laughs> and second of all, you might want to stock up because your supply is about to run out. One of the uh, largest makers of e-cigarettes may soon be forced to stop selling its products in this country. The Wall Street Journal says the FDA could order Juul e-cigarettes off the market as soon as today. The FDA has criticized Juul for gearing its products toward young people. It already barred the sale of fruity and sweet e-cigarette cartridges. Juul had hoped to continue selling tobacco flavors. It can appeal if the FDA does hand down that ban as expected. That's right, people. Jewel e-cigarettes are about to be banned, so your days of going around looking like you're blowing R2-D2 are over. <laughs> but this is a big move by the FDA, because you realize Jewel is the iconic vaping brand. So by them doing this, it's like going after soda by banning Coke, or going after Coke by banning Don Jr. <laughs> the Supreme Court the only government department where the dress code is retired Jedi. <laughs> you all know how America has been struggling with gun violence for the past, let's say, uh, half a century or so? Well, while everyone is trying to figure out a solution, the Supreme Court just weighed in in the most unhelpful way possible. Breaking news at this hour, the U.S. Supreme Court has just issued a major ruling in the challenge to a New York gun law. Now, this is the most significant Second Amendment ruling in more than a decade. In a six to three decision, the court struck down New York's law, which places restrictions on concealed handguns. The law in question in New York said to get a concealed carry permit, a person had to go to the county sheriff and show some special need. Today, the Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional, so this this will affect New York and it'll affect half a dozen other states that have similar laws in which you had to show some heightened need beyond just a general desire for self-defense to get a concealed carry permit. This expands the Second Amendment right. What we don't know is if it completely eliminates the possibility for any sort of gun, gun regulation. Oh, I think we do know. I think we do know. You can see where this is going. This Supreme Court is feeling themselves, huh? Because you realize they finally have all the justices they need to do anything they want. It's like Amy Coney Barrett was the last Infinity Stone that they needed. Yeah, <laughs> they put it in and now they're just snapping away at all the laws. It's like voting rights, gun control, Miranda rights, abortion. Mmm, I love this song, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the Supreme Court has struck down restrictions on who can carry guns outside of the home, saying that you can't require people to meet certain standards in order to get a license, which makes complete sense because that would be making the militia well-regulated. And I mean, you can't do that, you know? <laughs> it's not like it's written anywhere. Basically, <laughs> New York had a law for the past 100 years that said, if you want to just carry a gun around with you wherever you go, you need to prove that you have a specific reason. You need that gun, you know, for your protection. You have to go to the police, you have to tell them, you have to explain the whole thing. Like maybe someone is making threats against you or, or, or maybe you're Liam Neeson's daughter and people keep trying to kidnap you. <laughs> Even though it seems like it would be way easier to kidnap anyone else's daughter at this point. And the Supreme Court has said to New York, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. And you know, in a way, this is exciting as a New Yorker. Yeah, 
because I, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I've been sitting in rush hour traffic in New York with drivers screaming at each other and, and bikers cussing out the drivers and pedestrians wailing at the bikers and the drivers, the one thing I always think is, man, one thing that would calm this down is if everyone had a gun right now. <laughs> Just a Glock or two would really chill this situation out. I mean, it will switch things up, you know? Now, when you're on the subway and you see a guy reaching into his pants, you'll be like, oh, please let it be a dick, please let it be a dick. <laughs> let it be a dick, oh, please let it be a penis. <laughs> and it's crazy how this ruling is coming down at the exact same time that Congress finally reached a deal on gun reform. It took 30 years of trying to come up with these extremely minor gun safety measures. And then the Supreme Court just swoops in and moves everything back in the other direction. Yeah, Congress is like, we've reached a bipartisan agreement that 18 to 21 year olds can no longer buy guns in leap years between the hours of 3 a.m. and 3.15 a.m. And then the Supreme Court is like, all right, check this out. Starting now, every time it rains, it rains guns, yeah? What do you guys think? So this is obviously a big setback for gun safety. But if you ask me, New York just needs to get creative. Yeah, they need to think outside of the box. In the same way that Texas did, right? Look at what Texas did with banning abortion. They weren't allowed to ban it. So they just made a crazy new law that basically banned it anyway. That, that's what New York needs to do with guns. Like, yeah, they should say, okay, anyone can buy a gun if they want, but the gun stores are only open on the nights that the Knicks win. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move on from the people. <laughs> you know what's funny is like, whenever I'm at Madison Square Garden and I see the players, they're like, did you, I'm like, I don't make that joke. I love, I don't make these jokes. All right, let's move on from the people who are about to cause havoc with all their guns to the people who are already causing havoc with all their guns, the police. Over the last year, the city of Chicago has been rocked by incidents where police saw a civilian running away they decided to chase after them, and somehow they ended up killing them. So now, the police department has a new plan to stop those types of killings before they start. Chicago police officers will no longer be allowed to chase people on foot simply because they run away or give chase over minor offenses. The new policy requires enhanced supervision. Officers must file a report if they start a chase. Foot chases will be reviewed and officers must weigh the seriousness of the offense against the need to make an arrest. Officers can't start a chase if they're hurt, unaware of their location, unable to communicate or lose their radio or gun. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're a cop who's lost your radio and gun and you don't know where you are, <laughs> you are in no position to be chasing anyone. <laughs> yeah, maybe just throw in the towel, my man. Today's not your day. <laughs> but I think this policy actually makes sense because people used to assume that if you're running from a police officer, you must have done something wrong and you need to be chased down. But there are many reasons why someone might wanna run from the police. Maybe they're scared of the police. Or maybe the cop is their ex and they were just walking around in sweats <laughs> and they don't want their ex to see them and be like, oh, looks like I made the right choice. <laughs> and even if the person is a legitimate suspect, you wanna make sure that the crime is worth the chase, right? Because when police chase a suspect, it is way more likely to end in violence. Think about it, once somebody makes you sprint across half the city, you're way more likely to want to beat their ass when you catch them. <laughs> yeah, nobody's happy when they're forced to run. Even people running marathons are like, as soon as I get to the finish line, I'm gonna choke somebody. <laughs> All right, finally, let's move on to some international news. Right now, inflation is out of control. And I mean, we all know this, except probably Jeff Bezos, you know? <laughs> yeah, he probably treats bank accounts the same way the rest of us treat closet spaces, like, oh, where do I keep my winter dollars? There's no more space! <laughs> but for everyone else, inflation hurts. Prices are skyrocketing. Wages aren't keeping up. And it turns out it's not just America. This is happening all over the world, which is weird because Fox News told me that Joe Biden is the only reason we have inflation. <laughs> So that means he's also causing it in Denmark? Damn you, Joe! <laughs> now, one country in particular that's been struggling is the United Kingdom. 
right, where railway workers have been demanding an increase in their pay to help deal with inflation. But their demands have been ignored. So this week, they took action. Britain faces its biggest rail strikes in three decades after last-minute talks between a union and train companies failed to agree on pay. Up to 40,000 staffers staged a walkout in a protest over pay and job security. Good morning from a quieter than normal Paddington station where just one in five services will be running, as indeed they are around the country. The Prime Minister has told his cabinet these strikes are wrong and unnecessary. I want to say something about the rail strikes that are today causing significant disruption and inconvenience up and down the country, making it more difficult for people to get to work, uh, risking uh, people's appointments, making it more difficult for kids to sit exams, all sorts of unnecessary uh, aggravation uh, this is going to cause. Yes, it's preposterous. I, I mean, I, I need those trains to get to my illegal work parties. How else am I supposed to spread COVID? I mean, we'll think about it. This is really ridiculous. This is absolutely disgusting. Oh, absolutely. Yes, British railway workers are on strike. And now, British people have no way to travel to their silly sounding towns. Yeah, there's no way. Someone from Barton in the Beans can travel to Giggleswick or to Upton Snodsbury or even to Nether Wallop. How will they get to Nether Wallop? <laughs> but for real though, for real, for real. The truth is, a railway strike is actually really serious, right? Because it is crippling for the UK. So many of its people depend on the trains. You know, and I, I know you guys think British people just get around on flying umbrellas, but that's just the nannies. <laughs> the people need the trains. And please, don't get me wrong, I also understand that this train strike inconveniences countless people in the UK. But you know who's also inconvenienced, right? Because people are complaining. In the UK, they're like, oh, these people need to get back to work. This is terrible, just get back to work. But the train workers are inconvenienced. You realize train workers in the UK can't afford to make ends meet anymore. And there's many of them who haven't gotten a pay increase in 10 years. So if now's not the time to get a wage increase, and 10 years ago wasn't the time, and then nothing in between was the time, then when, when is the time? Right? Because I don't care what anybody says, I really don't. It's not fair for somebody to work a full-time job but not be able to make ends meet, especially when your bosses make millions in profits. Yeah. Like, if you, if you can't afford to live, then what's even the point of working? You only work so that you can live. That's why it's called making a living, right? Working without living is like being a parent but there's no kid. <laughs> Think about it, like parents, every parent knows that being a parent is miserable, but then your kid, they just, they smile at you or they do something for the first time and you're like, oh, it's all worth it, it was so adorable. But imagine if there was no child, huh? <laughs> imagine if there was no child, but you still got woken up in the middle of the night by screams out of no, ah, ah, and there's nothing. Or just every now and again, there's just diapers filled with shit everywhere in your house. And you just gotta, you just be like, there's no child, what am I doing this for? What's the point? And that's what these workers are going through. So this train strike is a big deal. It is affecting customers, it's affecting employees, it's affecting the British economy. But you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know who this also affects? The British trains. <laughs> boop, boop. Now that I've stopped working, I've had a lot of time alone with my thoughts. And I've realized, what the hell am I? I'm a train. I'm Thomas the train, but I have a human face, but where's the rest of my body? Do I have arms somewhere? Do I have a penis? Is it a human penis? Or is it a train penis? Help me somebody, help me find my train penis! Ah! Before we go, please consider donating to the National Black Justice Coalition. Since 2003, they have been America's leading national civil rights organization advocating for federal policies that fight against racism and homophobia. So if you can, please donate at the link below to help them reach their vision of a world where all people are fully empowered to participate safely, openly, and honestly in family, faith, community, regardless of their race, their class, their gender, identity, or their sexual orientation. It's a really great organization. 